The Odyssey of Homer. Translated by Richmond Lattimore. Book 1. Tell me, muse, of the man of many ways, who was driven far journeys, after he had sacked Troy's sacred citadel. Many were they whose cities he saw, whose minds he learned of, many the pains he suffered in his spirit on the wide sea, struggling for his own life and the homecoming of his companions. Even so he could not save his companions, hard though he strove to, they were destroyed by their own wild recklessness, fools, who devoured the oxen of Aelios, the sun god, and he took away the day of their homecoming. From some point here, goddess, daughter of Zeus, speak, and begin our story. Then all the others, as many as fled sheer destruction, were at home now, having escaped the sea and the fighting. This one alone, longing for his wife and his homecoming, was detained by the queenly nymph Calypso, bright among goddesses, in her hollowed caverns, desiring that he should be her husband. But when in the circling of the years that very year came in which the gods had spun for him his time of homecoming to Ithaca, not even then was he free of his trials nor among his own people. But all the gods pitied him except Poseidon, he remained relentlessly angry with godlike Odysseus, until his return to his own country. But Poseidon was gone now to visit the far Ethiopians, Ethiopians, most distant of men, who lived divided, some at the setting of Hyperion, some at his rising, to receive a hecatom of bulls and rams. There he sat at the feast and took his pleasure. Meanwhile the other Olympian gods were gathered together in the halls of Zeus. First among them to speak was the father of gods and mortals, for he was thinking in his heart of stately Aegisthus, whom Orestes, Agamemnon's far-famed son, had murdered. Remembering him he spoke now before the immortals, oh for shame, how the mortals put the blame upon us gods, for they say evils come from us, but it is they, rather, who by their own recklessness win sorrow beyond what is given, as now lately, beyond what was given, Aegisthus married the wife of Atreus' son, and murdered him on his homecoming, though he knew it was sheer destruction, for we ourselves had told him, sending Hermes, the mighty watcher, Argifons, not to kill the man, nor court his lady for marriage, for vengeance would come on him from Orestes, son of Atreides, whenever he came of age and longed for his own country. So Hermes told him, but for all his kind intention he could not persuade the mind of Aegisthus. And now he has paid for everything. Then in turn the goddess grey-eyed Athene answered him, son of Cronos, our father, O lordliest of the mighty, Aegisthus indeed has been struck down in a death well merited. Let any other man who does thus perish as he did. But the heart in me is torn for the sake of wise Odysseus, unhappy man, who still, far from his friends, is suffering griefs, on the sea-washed island, the navel of all the waters, a wooded island, and there a goddess has made her dwelling place, she is daughter of malignant Atlas, who has discovered all the depths of the sea, and himself sustains the towering columns which bracket earth and sky and hold them together. This is his daughter, she detains the grieving, unhappy man, and ever with soft and flattering words she works to charm him to forget Ithaca, and yet Odysseus, straining to get sight of the very smoke uprising from his own country, longs to die. But you, Olympian, the heart in you is heedless of him. Did not Odysseus do you grace by the ships of the Argives, making sacrifice in wide Troy? Why, Zeus, are you now so harsh with him? Then in turn Zeus who gathers the clouds made answer, My child, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? How could I forget Odysseus the godlike, he who is beyond all other men in mind, and who beyond others has given sacrifice to the gods, who hold wide heaven? It is the earth encircler Poseidon who, ever relentless, nurses a grudge because of the Cyclops, whose eye he blinded, for Polyphemos like a god, whose power is greatest over all the Cyclopes. Thusa, a nymph, was his mother, and she was daughter of Phorkes, lord of the barren salt water. She in the hollows of the caves had lain with Poseidon. For his sake Poseidon, shaker of the earth, although he does not kill Odysseus, yet drives him back from the land of his fathers. But come, let all of us who are here work out his homecoming and see to it that he returns. Poseidon shall put away his anger, for all alone and against the will of the other immortal gods united he can accomplish nothing. Then in turn the goddess grey-eyed Athene answered him, Son of Cronos, our father, O lordliest of the mighty, if in truth this is pleasing to the blessed immortals that Odysseus of the many designs shall return home, then let us dispatch Hermes, the guide, the slayer of Argos, to the island of Ogygia, so that with all speed he may announce to the lovely-haired nymph our absolute purpose, the homecoming of enduring Odysseus, that he shall come back. 
but I shall make my way to Ithaca, so that I may stir up his son a little, and put some confidence in him to summon into assembly the flowing haired Achaeans and make a statement to all the suitors, who now forever slaughter his crowding sheep and lumbering horn curved cattle, and I will convey him into Sparta and to Sandy Pylos to ask after his dear father's homecoming, if he can hear something, and so that among people he may win a good reputation. Speaking so she bound upon her feet the fair sandals, golden and immortal, that carried her over the water as over the dry boundless earth abreast of the wind's blast. Then she caught up a powerful spear, edged with sharp bronze, heavy, huge, thick, wherewith she beats down the battalions of fighting men, against whom she of the mighty father is angered, and descended in a flash of speed from the peaks of Olympos, and lighted in the land of Ithaca, at the doors of Odysseus at the threshold of the court, and in her hand was the bronze spear. She was disguised as a friend, leader of the Taphians, Mentes. There she found the haughty suitors. They at the moment in front of the doors were amusing their spirits with draught games, sitting about on skins of cattle whom they had slaughtered themselves, and about them, of their heralds and hard-working henchmen, some at the mixing bowls were combining wine and water, while others again with porous sponges were wiping the tables and setting them out, and others cutting meat in quantities. Now far the first to see Athene was godlike Telemachos, as he sat among the suitors, his heart deep grieving within him, imagining in his mind his great father, how he might come back and all throughout the house might cause the suitors to scatter, and hold his rightful place and be lord of his own possessions. With such thoughts, sitting among the suitors, he saw Athene and went straight to the forecourt, the heart within him scandalized that a guest should still be standing at the doors. He stood beside her and took her by the right hand, and relieved her of the bronze spear, and spoke to her and addressed her in winged words, Welcome, stranger. You shall be entertained as a guest among us. Afterward, when you have tasted dinner, you shall tell us what your need is. So speaking he led the way, and Pallas Athene followed him. Now, when the two of them were inside the lofty dwelling, he took the spear he carried and set it against a tall column in a rack for spears, of polished wood, where indeed there were other spears of patient-hearted Odysseus standing in numbers, and he led her and seated her in a chair, with a cloth to sit on, the chair splendid and elaborate. For her feet there was a footstool. For himself, he drew a painted bench next her, apart from the others, the suitors, for fear the guest, made uneasy by the uproar, might lose his appetite there among overbearing people, and so he might also ask him about his absent father. A maidservant brought water for them and poured it from a splendid and golden pitcher, holding it above a silver basin for them to wash, and she pulled a polished table before them. A grave housekeeper brought in the bread and served it to them, adding many good things to it, generous with her provisions, while a carver lifted platters of all kinds of meat and set them in front of them, and placed beside them the golden goblets, and a herald, going back and forth, poured the wine for them. Then the haughty suitors came in, and all of them straightway took their places in order on chairs and along the benches, and their heralds poured water over their hands for them to wash with, and the serving maids brought them bread heaped up in the baskets, and the young men filled the mixing bowls with wine for their drinking. They put their hands to the good things that lay ready before them. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, the suitors found their attention turned to other matters, the song and the dance, for these things come at the end of the feasting. A herald put the beautifully wrought lyre in the hands of Phemios, who sang for the suitors, because they made him. He played his lyre and struck up a fine song. Meanwhile Telemachos talked to Athene of the grey eyes, leaning his head close to hers, so that none of the others might hear him, Dear stranger, would you be scandalized at what I say to you? This is all they think of, the lyre and the singing. Easy for them, since without penalty they eat up the substance of a man whose white bones lie out in the rain and fester somewhere on the mainland, or roll in the wash of the breakers. If they were ever to see him coming back to Ithaca all the prayer of them all would be to be lighter on their feet instead of to be richer men for gold and clothing. As it is, he has died by an evil fate, and there is no comfort left for us, not even though someone among mortals tells us he will come back. His day of homecoming has perished. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. What man are you, and whence? Where is your city? Your parents? What kind of ship did you come here on? And how did the sailors bring you to Ithaca? What men do they claim that they are? For I do not think you could have travelled on foot to this country. And tell me this too, tell me truly, so that I may know it. Are you here for the first time, or are you a friend of my father's from abroad? Since many other men too used to come and visit our house, in the days when he used to go about among people. 
Then in turn the goddess grey-eyed Athene answered him, See, I will accurately answer all that you ask me. I announce myself as Mentes, son of Ankialos the wise, and my lordship is over the all-loving Taphians. Now I have come in as you see, with my ship and companions sailing over the wine-blue water to men of alien language, to Tamiz, after bronze, and my cargo is gleaming iron. And my ship stands nearby, at the country, away from the city, at the harbour, Rythron, underneath wooded Neon. Your father and I claim to be guest friends by heredity from far back, as you would know if you went to the aged hero Lertz, who, they say, no longer comes to the city now, but away by himself on his own land leads a hard life with an old woman to look after him, who serves him his victuals and drink, at the times when the weariness has befallen his body from making his toilsome way on the high ground of his vineyard. Now I have come. They told me he was here in this country, your father, I mean. But no. The gods are impeding his passage. For no death on the land has befallen the great Odysseus, but somewhere, alive on the wide sea, he is held captive, on a sea-washed island, and savage men have him in their keeping, rough men, who somehow keep him back, though he is unwilling. Now, I will make you a prophecy, in the way the immortals put it into my mind, and as I think it will come out, though I am no prophet, nor do I know the ways of birds clearly. He will not long be absent from the beloved land of his fathers, even if the bonds that hold him are iron, but he will be thinking of a way to come back, since he is a man of many resources. But come now tell me this and give me an accurate answer. Are you, big as you are, the very child of Odysseus? Indeed, you are strangely like about the head, the fine eyes, as I remember, we used to meet so often together before he went away to Troy, where others beside him and the greatest of the Argives went in their hollow vessels. Since that time I have not seen Odysseus nor has he seen me. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to her in answer, See, I will accurately answer all that you ask me. My mother says indeed I am his. I for my part do not know. Nobody really knows his own father. But how I wish I could have been rather son to some fortunate man, whom old age overtook among his possessions. But of mortal men, that man has proved the most ill-fated whose son they say I am, since you question me on this matter. Then in turn the goddess grey-eyed Athene answered him, The gods have not made yours a birth that will go nameless hereafter, since Penelope bore such a son as you are. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. What feast is this, what gathering? How does it concern you? A festival, or a wedding? Surely, no communal dinner. How insolently they seem to swagger about in their feasting all through the house. A serious man who came in among them could well be scandalized, seeing much disgraceful behavior. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to her in answer, My guest, since indeed you are asking me all these questions, there was a time this house was one that might be prosperous and above reproach, when a certain man was here in his country. But now the gods, with evil intention, have willed it otherwise, and they have caused him to disappear, in a way no other man has done. I should not have sorrowed so over his dying if he had gone down among his companions in the land of the Trojans, or in the arms of his friends, after he had wound up the fighting. So all the Achaeans would have heaped a grave mound over him, and he would have won great fame for himself and his son hereafter. But now ingloriously the storm winds have caught and carried him away, out of sight, out of knowledge, and he left pain and lamentation to me. Nor is it for him alone that I grieve in my pain now. No longer. For the gods have inflicted other cares on me. For all the greatest men who have the power in the islands, in Dulition and Same and in wooded Zakynthos, and all who in rocky Ithaca are holders of lordships, all these are after my mother for marriage, and wear my house out. And she does not refuse the hateful marriage, nor is she able to make an end of the matter, and these eating up my substance waste it away, and soon they will break me myself to pieces. Pallas Athene answered him in great indignation, Oh, for shame! How great your need is now of the absent Odysseus, who would lay his hands on these shameless suitors. I wish he could come now to stand in the outer doorway of his house, wearing a helmet and carrying shield and two spears, the way he was the first time that ever I saw him in our own house, drinking his wine and taking his pleasure, coming in from Ephyre and from Elo son of Murmuros. Odysseus, you see, had gone there also in his swift ship in search of a poison to kill men, so he might have it to smear on his bronze-headed arrows, but Elos would not give him any, since he feared the gods who endure forever. But my father did give it to him, so terribly did he love him. I wish that such an Odysseus would come now among the suitors. 
they all would find death was quick, and marriage a painful matter. Yet all these are things that are lying upon the God's knees, whether he will come home to his vengeance, here in his household, or whether he will not. Rather I will urge you to consider some means by which you can force the suitors out of your household. Come now, pay close attention to me and do as I tell you. Tomorrow, summon the Achaean warriors into assembly and publish your word to all, let the gods be your witnesses. Tell the suitors to scatter and go back to their own holdings, and as for your mother, if the spirit urges her to be married, let her go back to the palace of her powerful father, and they shall appoint the marriage and arrange for the wedding presents in great amount, as ought to go with a beloved daughter. But for yourself, I will counsel you shrewdly, and hope you will listen. Fit out a ship with twenty oars, the best you can come by, and go out to ask about your father who is so long absent, on the chance some mortal man can tell you, who has listened to rumour sent by Zeus. She more than others spreads news among people. First go to Pylos, and there question the great Nestor, and from there go over to Sparta to see fair-haired Menelos, since he came home last of all the bronze-armoured Achaeans. Thus if you hear your father is alive and on his way home, then, hard-pressed though you are, you should still hold out for another year. But if you hear he has died and lives no longer, then make your way home to the beloved land of your fathers, and pile up a tomb in his honour, and there make sacrifices in great amount, as is fitting. And give your mother to a husband. Then, after you have made an end of these matters, and done them, next you must consider well in your heart and spirit some means by which you can kill the suitors who are in your household, by treachery or open attack. You should not go on clinging to your childhood. You are no longer of an age to do that. Or have you not heard what glory was won by great arrests among all mankind, when he killed the murderer of his father, the treacherous Aegisthus, who had slain his famous father? So you too, dear friend, since I can see you are big and splendid, be bold also, so that in generations to come they will praise you. But now it is time for me to go back down to my fast ship and my companions, who must be very restless waiting for me. Let all this be on your mind, and do as I tell you. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to her in answer, My guest, your words to me are very kind and considerate, what any father would say to his son. I shall not forget them. But come now, stay with me, eager though you are for your journey, so that you may first bathe and take your ease and, well rested and happy in your heart, then go back to your ship with a present, something prized, altogether fine, which will be your keepsake from me, what loving guests and hosts bestow on each other. Then in turn the goddess grey-eyed Athene answered him, Do not detain me longer, eager as I am for my journey, and that gift, whatever it is your dear heart bids you give me, save it to give when I come next time, so I can take it home, and choose a good one, and a fair exchange will befall you. So spoke the goddess grey-eyed Athene, and there she departed like a bird soaring high in the air, but she left in his spirit determination and courage, and he remembered his father even more than he had before, and he guessed the meaning, and his heart was full of wonder, for he thought it was a divinity. At once he went over, a godlike man, to sit with the suitors. The famous singer was singing to them, and they in silence sat listening. He sang of the Achaeans' bitter homecoming from Troy, which Pallas Athene had inflicted upon them. The daughter of Icarios, circumspect Penelope, heard and heeded the magical song from her upper chamber, and descended the high staircase that was built in her palace, not all alone, since two handmaidens went to attend her. When she, shining among women, came near the suitors, she stood by the pillar that supported the roof with its joinery, holding her shining veil in front of her face, to shield it, and a devoted attendant was stationed on either side of her. All in tears she spoke then to the divine singer, Phemios, since you know many other actions of mortals and gods, which can charm men's hearts and which the singers celebrate, sit beside them and sing one of these, and let them in silence go on drinking their wine, but leave off singing this sad song, which always afflicts the dear heart deep inside me, since the unforgettable sorrow comes to me, beyond others. So dear a head do I long for whenever I am reminded of my husband, whose fame goes. Wide through Hellas and midmost Argos. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to her in answer, Why, my mother, do you begrudge this excellent singer his pleasing himself as the thought drives him? It is not the singers who are to blame, it must be Zeus's to blame, who gives out to men who eat bread, to each and all, the way he wills it. There is nothing wrong in his singing the sad return of the Danans. People, surely, always give more applause to that song which is the latest to circulate among the listeners. So let your heart and let your spirit be hardened to listen. Odysseus is not the only one who lost his homecoming day at Troy. 
there were many others who perished, besides him. Go therefore back in the house, and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff, and see to it that your handmaidens ply their work also, but the men must see to discussion, all men, but I most of all. For mine is the power in this household. Penelope went back inside the house, in amazement, for she laid the serious words of her son deep away in her spirit, and she went back to the upper story with her attendant women, and wept for Odysseus, her beloved husband, until grey-eyed Athene cast sweet slumber over her eyelids. But the suitors all through the shadowy halls were raising a tumult, and all prayed for the privilege of lying beside her, until the thoughtful Telemachos began speaking among them, You suitors of my mother, overbearing in your opacity, now let us dine and take our pleasure, and let there be no shouting, since it is a splendid thing to listen to a singer who is such a singer as this man is, with a voice such as gods have. Then tomorrow let us all go to the place of assembly, and hold a session, where I will give you my forthright statement, that you go out of my place and do your feasting elsewhere, eating up your own possessions, taking turns, household by household. But if you decide it is more profitable and better to go on, eating up one man's livelihood, without payment, then spoil my house. I will cry out to the gods everlasting in the hope that Zeus might somehow grant a reversal of fortunes. Then you may perish in this house, with no payment given. So he spoke, and all of them bit their lips, in amazement at Telemachos and the daring way he had spoken to them. It was Antinous the son of Eupeth who answered, Telemachos, surely it must be the very gods who prompt you to take the imperious line and speak so daringly to us. I hope the son of Kronos never makes you our king in Sigurd Ithaca. Though to be sure that is your right by inheritance. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, Antinous, in case you wonder at what I am saying, I would be willing to take that right, if Zeus should give it. Do you think that is the worst thing that could happen to anyone? It is not bad to be a king. Speedily the king's house grows prosperous, and he himself has rank beyond others. But in fact there are many other Achaean princes, young and old, in Sigurd Ithaca, any of whom might hold this position, now that the great Odysseus has perished. But I will be the absolute lord over my own household and my servants, whom the great Odysseus won by force for me. Then in turn Eurymachos, son of Polybos, answered, Telemachos, these matters, and which of the Achaeans will be king in Sigurd Ithaca, are questions that lie on the gods' knees. But I hope you keep your possessions and stay lord in your own household. May the man never come who against your will and by force shall drive you away from your holdings, while Ithaca is a place still lived in. But, best of men, I wish to ask you about this stranger, where he came from, what country he announces as being his own, where lies his parent's stock, and the fields of his father's. Has he brought some message from your father who is on his way here? Or did he arrive pursuing some matter of his own business? How suddenly he started away and vanished, and did not wait to be made known. He was no mean man, by the look of him. Then the thoughtful Telemachos said to him in answer, Eurymachos, there is no more hope of my father's homecoming. I believe no messages any more, even should there be one, nor pay attention to any prophecy, those times my mother calls some diviner into the house and asks him questions. This stranger is a friend of my father's. He comes from Taphos and announces himself as Mentes, the son of Ankialos the wise. And he is lord of the lovers of the oar, the Taphians. So spoke Telemachos, but in his heart he knew the immortal goddess. The others, turning to the dance and the delightful song, took their pleasure and awaited the coming of evening, and the black evening came on as they were taking their pleasure. Then they went home to go to bed, each to his own house, but Telemachos went where, off the splendid courtyard, a lofty bedchamber had been built for him, in a sheltered corner. There he went to go to bed, his heart full of problems, and devoted Eurycleia went with him, and carried the flaring torches. She was the daughter of Ops the son of Paysenor, and Laertes had bought her long ago with his own possessions when she was still in her first youth, and gave twenty oxen for her, and he favoured her in his house as much as his own devoted wife, but never slept with her, for fear of his wife's anger. She now carried the flaring torches for him. She loved him more than the other maidservants, and had nursed him when he was little. He opened the doors of the close compacted bedchamber, and sat down on the bed and took off his soft tunic and put it into the hands of the sagacious old woman, and she in turn folded the tunic, and took care of it for him, and hung it up on a peg beside the corded bedstead. Then she went out of the room, and pulled the door to behind her with a silver hook, and with a strap drew home the door bolt. 
there, all night long, wrapped in a soft sheepskin, he pondered in his heart the journey that Pallas Athene had counseled.